So this week we're going to talk about um, drug delivery, and this is chapter uh, 14. So this is an example of what I call in the textbook biomolecular engineering. And um, this is one of my uh, favorite weeks of the course because this is my, uh, my research specialty is drug delivery. And so what I want to do um, today, Thursday, and, and then we'll continue in section, is today I'm going to sort of set up uh, set up the problem, talk about some definitions to think about if one is building drug delivery systems, uh, think about some basic concepts in drug delivery, and we're going to do that by, by thinking about uh, sort of common modes of drug administration and why some of them work with some drugs and not with others. And uh, so sort of lay the foundations today, and then on, um, on Thursday we'll talk about what's new in drug delivery and what things you can expect in the future, things that are still being built. And then you'll get to make some drug delivery systems in, in section on Thursday afternoon. So um, this is really uh, a, a logical extension of what we started talking about last week when we moved from talking about the immune system and how it operates to, uh, to administration intentionally of vaccines to alter the immune system or to change uh, your body's response. And in some senses, you could think about delivery of a vaccine like delivery of a drug. We're introducing something not naturally in the body, into the body, in order to have some kind of biological effect. So it's the uh, same thing as delivery of a drug. And we, and we also thought about delivery in a variety of uh, ways. We thought about uh, injection of vaccines like the, like the smallpox vaccine. We thought about oral administration of a vaccine in the case of the, the, uh, the uh, oral polio uh, vaccine. And uh, so I just wanted to show you this picture uh, to remind you that you already know something about drug delivery. And what we're going to talk about is an extension of what we uh, started talking about last week. Now, in the case of a vaccine, uh, you'll remember that the intent was to, uh, was to administer either proteins usually proteins or whole viruses, or we talked at the end of the class on Thursday about administering DNA with the intention that you're going to uh, bring some new molecules into a special class of cells called antigen-presenting cells, that those antigen-presenting cells are going to be ch changed as a result of their experience with this vaccine, such that they present new molecules on their surface. That's the change that comes about. and then that change in this cell is going to stimulate changes in other cells. If a, a humoral immune response or an antibody-mediated immune response is generated, then the change in antigen-presenting cells is going to influence B cells to differentiate and proliferate, etc. So this is an example of a very particular example of what happens when you administer a drug as well. Chemicals are introduced into the body. The intent is usually to make some kind of a biochemical change in cells or or maybe many cells in your body, such that their function is altered in some way that's helpful uh, to you. And we didn't really talk about it last week, but, but in some cases, immunization really is like drug delivery, particularly in the case of what's called passive immunization, where instead of introducing a pathogen or a piece of a pathogen to an individual, you actually make antibodies outside of the individual. So manufacture them in some ways, and we talked about ways of manufacturing antibodies a few weeks ago, and then introduce those antibodies themselves into the person to provide protection against whatever pathogen those antibodies are directed against. And if any of you have traveled to areas of the world where hepatitis A is uh, common in parts of Asia, for example. You might have gotten a shot of gamma globulin, uh, which is really just uh, antibodies that are enriched for anti-hepatitis A activity. Now, th the, the difference between that and a vaccine is that that dose of antibodies only lasts for a certain length of time, about 30 to 60 days. So you have to get the shot 30 to 60 days before you're going to be in the area where you're exposed. In the same way, we're going to think a lot about the timing of drugs. How long do their effects last? What determines how long they last? And what does it mean if you still need the drug when its effect is gone? How does taking subsequent quantities of the drug affect its concentration in your body, for example? 
So I'm going to start with some uh, definitions, and I realize that you can, you can read this uh, on your own, and hopefully already have read some of this in the, in the chapter, but just to, to make sure that we have the vocabulary uh, right, and some of these are words that you're familiar with, like drug, and a drug is any molecule which can be introduced into the body which alters body function on a molecular uh, level. And so you're used to thinking about drugs you might take for a, a headache, like uh, aspirin or ibuprofen, um, or uh, if you have uh, asthma, for example, you might take, uh, you might take drugs that affect uh, your uh, bronchioles or the pathways, the airways in your lung by dilating them so it's easier to get air in and out. Um, and so these are molecules which are introduced into the body. They make some kind of change in the body on a molecular level. Pharmacology is the science of dealing with these interactions of molecules that are introduced into the body. Um, and they're usually molecules that are generated from outside the body, maybe synthesized in some way. They might be molecules that are not ordinarily found in our bodies, but are known to have some effects. They might be derivatives of molecules that are naturally found in our bodies. For example, Parkinson's disease is treated by a derivative of the neurotransmitter dopamine and you're introducing something that looks very much like a natural molecule back into the body to have an effect. Toxicology is that branch of pharmacology that thinks exclusively about toxic effects of the drug. And one of the main challenges with developing drugs and drug delivery systems is that drugs have unwanted effects. Right? They have the effect that you desire at the tissue or within the cells uh, that they were designed to affect, but they can also have effects in other parts of the body. And those effects are side effects, right? Those effects are toxicities or unwanted, uh, unwanted changes in the body as a result of the drug. We're going to talk about two important, different, but related concepts called pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. Pharmacodynamics is the effect of a drug on a body. And it's usually on the body or on cells from the body, and it's usually defined by a dose-response curve. Dose-response means I give a certain amount of the drug and I see what effect it has. I give more, I see what effect that has. I give more, I see what effect that has. And you can imagine that's a very important thing to define for any drug, because you want to deliver the minimum dose that's needed to produce the desired effect. Right? You don't want to introduce any more than necessary. And so understanding the relationship between dose delivered and biological response is very important. Often that's done first on cells and culture, for example. You want to understand how a chemotherapy agent, a potential agent for treating tumors, will affect tumors in a person. The first thing you do is you might have some cultured tumor cells, and you expose those cells to different concentrations of the drug. And you see, at what dose do I begin to see cell death? or killing of the tumor cells. That's one kind of dose-response relationship. Now, you could understand, probably, that that might be very different if you administer that same dose into a person. And we're going to talk about why dose responses in people are different than dose responses in cell cultures or in more artificial systems. So the pharmacodynamic effect of a drug, or, or the study of pharmacodynamics, is what does the drug do to the body? And usually that's defined at specific doses. What does it do? Pharmacokinetics has to do with how your body handles the drug. And the body has exquisite mechanisms for getting rid of molecules. Molecules that are produced naturally in your body only have a certain lifetime. Likewise, antibodies that we, or uh, molecules that we introduce from outside the body also have a lifetime, and that depends on the mechanism that your body uses to get rid of the compound. Well, that, um, that manner in which the body handles a drug, how the body changes the drug, how it excretes the drug, is called pharmacokinetics, and that has to do with what the body does to the drug, not what the drug does to the body. So that, that's a, the, the easiest way to think about it. One pharmacokinetic concept that's very important is the concept of bioavailability. Now, if I have a dose of the drug, let's say 100 milligrams of a drug, and I administer it to an individual, then how much of that drug actually gets into the body where it can be useful? 
And bioavailability is going to depend on how we administer the drug. If we administer it orally versus injected intravenously versus some of the other routes of administration we'll talk about in a few minutes, the main effect of changing the route of administration is to change the bioavailability or how much of the drug actually reaches the active site. A related concept is biotransformation. Biotransformation re it refers to all the mechanisms that your body could use to convert a drug into something else. And often that conversion of a drug into something else is an important part of how your body gets rid of a drug. And many biotransformation reactions happen in the liver. The liver is a very active site of metabolism and chemical reaction. And many drugs that we take are converted into other compounds in the liver, by cells in the liver. And often, this conversion into another compound is the first step in your body getting rid of it. Sometimes it's the only step. Sometimes your liver is able to convert a molecule into something that's completely inactive. Right? For example, the, if you take alcohol, which is a drug, uh, it's converted in the liver into other molecules which don't have the biological effect of alcohol. It's done by uh, enzymes in uh, liver cells, including the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase. Sometimes, we won't talk so much about this, but I want you to, to uh, at least realize it, is that sometimes we deliver molecules that are inactive, that don't have any response, your body doesn't have any response to them, but we deliver them knowing that your liver is going to convert them into something active that they're going to be biotransformed by some chemical reaction into an active uh, compound. So it's another aspect of uh, biotransformation. Okay, so I want to spend um, the next 15 or 20 minutes or so talking about how drugs are administered. And, and in particular, uh, that question should be, why are they administered in different, uh, in different ways? Why is ibuprofen uh, taken orally? Uh, for example, but some antibiotics or chemotherapy drugs have to be injected uh, directly into the bloodstream. So why is that, do you think? Why are some drugs administered in different ways? It could be that you're targeting different parts of the body, and so you want to deliver them at their site of action. That might be one, uh, w one reason uh, to do it. And there, what are you changing? You're changing, uh, you're changing the potential for side effects, really, or the potential for toxicity of the drug. Because if you can deliver more of it at the site of action, um, then, uh, then less of it goes to the rest of the body, where it might cause unwanted effects. And so that's a, that's a very good reason to target it. Sometimes there are biological barriers to <coughs> drugs entering different parts of the body. And we're going to start by talking about the body as sort of a single unit or compartment. And when I introduce drugs into them, those drugs are available everywhere. But that's not true. And there are some parts of the body that are protected from entry of drugs. And the brain is the most famous uh, of those of those parts of the body that are protected. And it makes sense that the brain is protected because, uh, because our, the function of the brain depends on the balance of chemical concentrations within it, the concentrations of ions and neurotransmitters and any molecules that could potentially interfere with ions or neurotransmitters. And so our brain chemistry has to be very tightly regulated in order for us to stay awake and pay attention and do the things that we normally do. S in contrast, the chemistry in our blood is changing throughout the day. Right? After you eat, chemistry changes because molecules are absorbed from the, from the uh, intestine. And as those molecules get processed by the body, concentration in the blood changes. If your brain chemistry was changing in that same way, Right, then you'd, you'd be slipping in and out of consciousness. And you notice that you do a little bit, right? After lunch, it's a little bit harder to pay attention than before 
uh, lunch because the chemistry is changing. But that change in chemistry is muted by the blood-brain barrier or the fact that molecules can't get very easily into the brain. Okay. Why, why else might, uh, might drugs be administered in different ways? Think about insulin. What do you know about insulin as a drug? Yeah, Caitlin? Speed of action is an important is an important thing, and we're going to talk in a few minutes about some drugs where onset of action is very important. It needs to act very quickly, and the way that you administer it has a big effect on how rapidly concentrations in the body rise. And so, some things you need to act uh, very rapidly. Uh, you'll pick the mode of administration to to do that. Thanks, John. There's another issue with insulin. Which, which we'll come to. Keep that one in mind. So this is a table that's, that's in the book, and I want to uh, go through it uh, relatively quickly because I think um, you, can, you can read it and it's pretty understandable on its own. But I, I want to I use these specific examples of different routes of administration to think about the answer to this question, why are drugs administered in different ways? And more importantly, to think about the biology or the physiology of your body that leads to these alternate forms of administration. So one uh, mode is intravenous injection. Now we're going to talk, there are different kinds of injection, right? You can put a needle into different parts of the body. You can put it into a muscle, you can put it under the skin, you can put it actually into the spinal fluid that surrounds your, that surrounds, uh, your uh, spinal cord. Uh, intravenous injection refers specifically to uh, a needle that's placed within the bloodstream, within a vein, and so drugs are introduced directly into the bloodstream. And uh, the advantages of that should be obvious. That's, that's what was related to, to Caitlin's uh, comment, that drug is immediately introduced into the blood, and so it's immediately distributed throughout your body and available for action wherever it's needed. And so onset of action is very rapid. In addition, it's the bioavailability is 100%. We've introduced the drug into the blood directly, into your, your circulatory flow. And so all of the molecules that are administered to the patient are available for action. Now usually, we, we're gonna, we think about bioavailability as the fraction of the drug that ends up in the blood. And you might say, well, but that might not be where the drug acts. The drug might act in the brain, or it might act in the kidney, or it might act in your muscles. And being in the blood is not the same as being in those tissues. And you're right. That, that's right. Uh, but, but it's hard to measure those concentrations in individual tissues. And so we define bioavailability as the fraction of a drug dose that gets into the blood. Now, why wouldn't we do intravenous administration for everything? Because if it is fast, usually you don't want to wait for, you know, you, you want the drug to act as rapidly as possible. Um, and, and you'd like all the drug molecules to be bioavailable. You don't like all of them to be useful. So why don't we use intravenous administration all the time? Well, it probably is obvious that, that, that not uh, that, that is not so easy to do, that in general, uh, safe intravenous administration requires trained medical personnel, so usually you're in a doctor's office or a hospital. Uh, you, you don't do it yourself at home, and, um, and there is a risk, because you're introducing drugs at high concentration into the blood. Uh, there's, there's much more risk of overdose or toxicity, because the concentration is going to change very rapidly, and even though you might know what the average response to a drug is, right? Average among a population of people. We're all different, right? We're all different in ways that are important to how drugs act, right? And, and you know this. If you take ibuprofen, you read the dosage on the label, it will say something like, if you're over 12 years old, you take one dose, and if you're under 12, you take another dose. Right? So size, 
of the person or age of the person is an important determinant of how much dose you take. Gender is often an important determinant. Right? Your s overall state of health is an important determinant. And you can't know those things for everybody. Right? You could go on and on in this list. And so you, one individual might be more sensitive to doses of the drug than another. If you're introducing all the drug at one time intravenously, the potential for an unwanted response is higher. It's a risk of infection because you're introducing something directly into the bloodstream if it's not done uh, properly. And it's not comfortable, right? I mean, no, most people don't want to have an intravenous injection, right? And so uh, you might not do it in cases where even it, it would benefit you. And so those are disadvantages. Um, but it's, it's, uh, but it's uh, a very uh, safe and effective and useful mode of administration for some kinds of compounds. For example, for antibiotics, if you happen to have what's called sepsis or an infection that's spread into your bloodstream, one of the only ways to combat those infections effectively is to introduce antibiotics directly into the bloodstream. Intravenous infusion is a similar, is a similar uh, mode. But now, instead of a one-time injection, with an intravenous injection, you have a syringe full of drug, a needle in the, in, the, in the circulatory system, and you introduce the drug all at once. In infusion, you slowly pump the drug in. And you might be pumping it in continuously over a long period of time, maybe over hours or over uh, days. And uh, so sometimes this is done, uh, you've seen on TV shows, uh, you know, a bag of a solution hanging up on a on a, uh, on a pole and, uh, and a tube going into a patient's arm. And so this is a, an infusion where the infusion is driven by the gravity flow of fluid through the tube into the, into, um, in, into the patient's blood vessel. Right? That's one example of an infusion. Other examples are, uh, you know, there might be a pump involved at some point. You have a pump in between the bag of fluid and the and the needle that goes into the arm. And in this way, you can control the flow much more carefully. Right, you can control the flow much more carefully. So one example of where that's done in the hospital is the molecule heparin, which is an anticoagulant. And it's uh, needed for, um, for certain patients who are at risk of uh, having blood clots, for example. And this might be. Um, um, they might be at risk for blood clots for a variety of reasons, but you introduce the molecule heparin, which reduces the likelihood that clots will form. Only you need to have a continuous level of heparin. You need to have that heparin concentration continuously at some level. And so you continuously infuse it directly into the, into the, um, into the uh, circulatory system. Now, this is a, a very effective method for administering drugs because you're slowly adding the drug and you're watching to see what concentration is maintained in the person and you're adjusting the rate by, by tuning the pump until you get exactly the concentration that you want. Right? And then you can leave it there and as long as the patient stays roughly the same, then their concentration will remain roughly the same. And so you can expose them to a uh, drug over a long period of time and have a biological effect that's constant over a long period of time. And that's, that's very uh, useful in certain situations like this one I've uh, mentioned. Again, it's 100% bioavailable, and you have continuous control over plasma levels. For example, what if you knew that the patient was more at risk of developing blood clots at night? Well, then you'd put a programmable pump on it. And you'd program the pump so that the rate of infusion increased during the night and then went down again in the morning. And in that way, you could increase the concentration of drug at night and then decrease it uh, during the day. And so you'd only be using the amount of drug that was needed for a biological effect. And you'd be adjusting that biological effect for the needs of the patient in a very sort of interactive way. And you can imagine now extending that very simple approach with a needle in the bloodstream and a pump and a reservoir of fluid uh, to deliver any pattern of drug that was needed for that individual. Okay. 
So what's, what, what, why isn't that done all the time? Well, for the same reasons that intravenous infusion aren't done all the time, plus some, because this is even more uh, complex, right? And so it requires continuous monitoring. And so there have to be people there in case there is some unexpected event uh, in order to turn off the pump or to adjust the flow. And so that really requires hospitalization in most cases. Now we're going to get to the point next time where we talk about some examples of infusion using pumps that can be, uh, that can be worn by individuals. They can leave the hospital with these pumps either implanted within them or, uh, or, or, or strapped to their belt, for example. But in general, that's done only in unusual uh, situations. Subcutaneous injection and intramuscular injection are similar to intravenous injection in that it's an injection from a needle. It's a one-time introduce all the drug at once, but you're putting the needle in a different place. Instead of intentionally putting the needle into, into a vein so that you introduce drug into the blood, you put it uh, either in a muscle, right, and you could feel like a muscle mass of your arm uh, or, um, or, 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 or your backside you've ever had an injection there. They don't do this so commonly anymore. I'm not sure why, but I can imagine why. But, but, um, but uh, in, into, a, into a, a muscle mass, and then the molecules are absorbed from that muscle into the blood. Or subcutaneously is un subcutaneous. Cutaneous is skin. Sub is under. This is an injection under the skin. And so you could pull up on your skin a little flap. You can sort of pull it away from the muscle, and you'd insert the needle under there and introduce a little uh, reservoir of uh, drug solution underneath the skin. Um, now, this is how uh, diabetics administer insulin to themselves, uh, usually. They put a needle uh, into the muscle and they inject a, um, a, uh, a volume of an insulin-containing solution into the muscle space. I say on this she here that bioavailability in that case is usually high. Why is it? Why do you think bioavailability is high? Bioavailability is high for these uh, particular modes. Why is it high for intramuscular injection? And it might be 80 percent or 90 percent. So it's not a hundred, but it's pretty high. Why is that? How does the drug get into the blood from there, if I inject it into muscle? Justin? Yeah, so, so your muscle is being perfused by blood all the time, right? It gets blood flow. There's, there's arteries going in, capillary networks, and veins that are collecting blood. So there's a very rich blood supply in muscle. And so you inject it into the muscle tissue, and the drug just sort of percolates in or diffuses in to the blood vessels that are already there. Now, the, the effects tend to last longer than an intravenous administration because it takes some time for the drugs to move from this reservoir where you've injected them, this little depot in the muscle. It takes some time for the drugs to move into your bloodstream. Right? And so you get a prolonged effect because of that. Not all the drug is available at once. You also don't get all the drug in because some of it is metabolized locally or it doesn't go into the blood vessels at all, and so it doesn't get distributed. So bioavailability is not 100 percent, but it's often pretty high. And it's not as hazardous because you're not actually introducing a needle into a vein. It can be done uh, by, um, by uh, individuals at home. And so diabetics can do this. They can do it several times a day. Um, and, uh, but it's still uncomfortable. Most people don't want to do it. And you wouldn't do it if there was an alternative. Right? So why is there no alternative for insulin? Why, why do diabetics do it this way? Why do they inject insulin in this way? And I think most of you could understand that they would prefer not to. What would they prefer to do? If you were a, a diabetic patient and you needed insulin, what would you prefer to do? Kate? You'd prefer to take a pill, right? You'd prefer to take a pill, and that's the next one on the list, is, is oral um, uh, administration. You'd prefer to take a pill, but you can't with insulin because insulin is a protein. 
Insulin is a protein that is digested in the, uh, in the intestinal tract. And that's one of the functions of our, of our gut, is to digest foods that we, that we eat, foods that contain proteins, for example. And so your, uh, your intestinal system is very efficient at breaking down proteins into their constituent amino acids. And it does that so that you can extract amino acids from food and use them for other things. If, the, if a protein is a drug, you need it to enter the bloodstream without being broken down. When it's broken down, it doesn't have the effect any longer. And so insulin can't be delivered orally, primarily because it's digested uh, within the uh, stomach and small intestine before it's absorbed. Um, another problem with, uh, with developing a pill or oral forms of insulin is that large molecules like insulin, which is a protein, has a molecular weight of about 5,000, are not absorbed very easily through the intestinal wall. And we talked about this several weeks ago. Your intestinal wall is a, it's a tube. It's a tube that the surface of the tube is made up of a continuous sheet or monolayer of cells. And these cells are connected by tight junctions. Remember that picture I showed you several weeks ago. And because of that, for a molecule to enter, it has to be able to go through that monolayer of cells. So even if insulin wasn't broken down to its constituent molecules, it couldn't be absorbed very easily because it's a large molecule. And only molecules that are small and relatively lipid soluble can go through monolayers of cells like the epithelium of the intestine. Right, so there's two reasons why insulin is not very bioavailable when it's given orally. Right? And that's one way of saying insulin doesn't end up in the blood. Right? Insulin is not bioavailable when delivered orally. Some drugs are aspirin, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, things that you might take routinely for um, muscle aches or headaches are, are available orally. They're small molecules. They aren't, uh, they aren't digested appreciably or only a fraction of them are, are, are digested. So that if you take 10 milligrams, maybe five milligrams of them are not broken down in the gut and can be absorbed. Right? So uh, one of the problems with oral administration is that drugs are degraded before they're absorbed into the body. Now we could tolerate that with aspirin. Why do you think that's acceptable uh, with aspirin to have some fraction of it broken down in the body, broken down in the gut before it's absorbed. Why is that acceptable? How much does aspirin cost? Not very much. You don't think about it when you go buy uh, you know, a couple of tablets of aspirin or you go buy a bottle of aspirin or, or ibuprofen because it, it costs something, but it doesn't cost so much. And so if you had to pay two times as much because you lost half of it because it was degraded before it got absorbed, that might be OK, right? Because you're more likely to use it because it's a pill and not an injection. And you're willing to pay more for that convenience, right? And so often, uh, drugs that are uh, orally administered, they're not 100% bioavailable. Only a fraction of it gets into your blood. But they're molecules that can be produced cheaply enough that you can still take a, a dose that's larger than what you would need, knowing that half of it is not going to enter your body. Right, does that make that sense? Uh, the other thing about, about aspirin is that um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not aspirin. I'll use aspirin as an example, realizing that nobody uses aspirin for headaches anymore. But, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a good example, because it's a molecule that's very safe. And a safe drug is one in which the concentration at which it causes toxic effects is much higher than the concentration at which it causes good effects or the effect that you want. So we know in aspirin that if you get your concentration up to a certain level, your headache will go away. You'd have to get a much higher level in your blood before you began to see side effects or unwanted effects. And in, um, in aspirin, those side effects are that your ears start to ring because it starts to affect uh, the, um, your mechanisms of hearing. 
the cells within your, uh, within your cochlea start to be affected by concentrations of the drug at a certain level. But you have to take a lot in order to get up there. Right. So this difference between an effective dose and a toxic dose is very important for, uh, for drugs. And drugs that have a big difference between the safe dose and the effective dose are ones that you can give to patients and trust them to take safely. You can imagine if the toxic dose was very close to the effective dose, that might not be a drug that you would want to have patients administering themselves. Because what if they accidentally take one too many pills? Or they take them too close together, right? They could <coughs> produce uh, toxic side effects. So aspirin is an example where you have a big window between effective and toxic. Chemotherapy drugs are drugs where there's a very narrow window between effective and toxic. And so those are usually given with the, um, with the help and guidance of a physician. Okay. Um, there's a similar mode of administration called uh, sublingual or buccal. And here, um, here the, the drug is not swallowed, it's taken in the mouth, but, it's, but you, you hold the pill or the capsule underneath your tongue and you allow it to dissolve there. And so the drug is, enters your body because it's absorbed through the membranes in your mouth, particularly the membranes under your tongue. And this is a common mode of administration for nitroglycerin. If you have uh, grandparents or, 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 or friends who are older that have certain kind of heart disease where they get chest pain, they might carry with them tablets of nitroglycerin. And if they begin to experience pain, they'll put one of these tablets underneath their uh, tongue and they'll let it dissolve. And there's a, a number of reasons for doing this. And the most important one is that um, when, when you're taking a drug orally, you're taking advantage of the mechanisms that your body has for getting food and nutrients. And you're using those mechanisms to get a drug. When, you're, when, when molecules are absorbed through your intestine, they, uh, they go through the intestinal wall, they enter the blood stream that surrounds the intestine, and then the way that your anatomy is set up, all of the blood flow from your intestine goes directly to your liver. It goes directly to your liver, and from your liver, it goes back into the vena cava and then to the heart. Now, why, why would you design a system like that? where all the blood from your intestine goes right to your liver first. Justin? Purifying. Purifying and processing of the stuff that comes from the intestine. Stuff like food, nutrients that are extracted from food, sugars, fats, proteins, right, that are extracted from food, that go to your liver. Why do they go to your liver? Because your liver is a very important metabolic organ, and it is important for processing proteins and fats and sugars. And so by sending all those molecules that are absorbed from the intestine to the liver first, you get a, you get a jump start on processing of these molecules into the substrates that you need for life. Right? So that's a really good setup for nutrition. But I also mentioned, remember, that biotransformation or breakdown of drugs often occurs in the liver. And so if drugs are absorbed the same way that food is, they go right to the liver, and I'm pointing here because that's where my liver is, right? They go right to the liver, and your liver starts to break it down right away, before it even gets to your bloodstream, really, before it circulates to the rest of your body. And so I lose a fraction of drug because it's degraded within the gut. I lose a fraction because it can't absorb very rapidly, and I lose another fraction because the liver breaks it down before it ever gets back to my heart, right? And your, then your heart can circulate it. Well, it turns out that the blood supply to the, to the membranes in your mouth don't go to the liver. It's, it's unusual. They go directly into the in, uh, superior vena cava and into your heart. And so drug molecules that are absorbed in your mouth bypass the liver. And they go directly to your, the rest of your body first. And then, of course, they're going to end up in the liver as things get circulated around. But they avoid going to the liver the first time. And that's called, here on this graph, avoiding first-pass metabolism in the liver. 
this metabolism that occurs on the first shot right from the intestine is called first pass metabolism. Nitroglycerin would be very readily broken down in the liver and so this way it goes directly to the heart without ever having to pass through the liver and it can, it can uh, quickly treat uh, heart disease. Now, why don't you do that with all sorts of things? Uh, well, uh, it, it only works for certain kinds of compounds, compounds that can be absorbed through those membranes in your mouth. So they have to be very lipid soluble. They also have to be very potent because one difference between your mouth and the intestine is that the surface area in your mouth is fairly small. Right, the surface area uh, in your mouth is fairly small and so only a limited number of drugs can absorb through. Whereas, why is your intestine so long? You know that your intestinal, so if you took it out and stretched it out, it would be a, a tube, a continuous tube that's about 30 feet long. Why is your intestine that long, packed into this small space? So that it can have a big surface area to absorb lots of stuff. Right? Big surface area, lots of absorption, small surface area, little absorption. So it has to be a very potent drug in order to be absorbed at a sufficient concentration through this, um, through this limited space. So I think those are the main concepts that I wanted to introduce by thinking about these different methods of administration. There's more of them listed here. Um, some of them have to do with what, with what Caitlin mentioned. If you want if you ha want a drug that works in the eye, for example, a drug to treat glaucoma, why take a drug orally and, and expose your whole body to the drug when you could just put drops in your eye directly? And that's how many glaucoma drugs are delivered. You might have eye drops that you just put uh, into the space underneath your eye, for example. Right? And that's a more targeted delivery, targeted because you're putting the drug at the site where it's needed. I'm sure you have examples of that, you know, topical ointments like uh, antibacterial cream that you might put on something if you have a cut and you want to keep it from being infected. You don't take antibiotics by mouth and have them all over your body. You put a little topical treatment on the site because you're targeting the drug to the site uh, that you need. Okay. And on the next uh, slide, there's some other uh, more uncommon modes of administration, um, rectal, transdermal, vaginal. We, we won't talk very much about those. Um, but ne and next week, we'll talk about uh, special kinds of drug delivery systems that are useful for certain kinds of administration, um, like um, 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 what are called controlled release implants we'll talk about next time. Okay. But I, I wanted, I, I've given you a lot of words and I've tried to introduce a lot of concepts by thinking about things that you know about. I want to try to put this in some framework that allows you to think about uh, quantitatively what it means, uh, what these uh, factors mean. And so we're going to introduce drugs into a patient and what we would like to know is how rapidly do those drugs become available, what fraction of the drugs become available, and how long does the one dose we give last. And as I mentioned, that's complicated, right? Complicated because our anatomy is complicated and complicated because we're all different individuals and our anatomy and physiology differs. And so it's a hard thing to do to describe how even one particular kind of drug acts in a population of people is difficult. And so we have to start somewhere. So we're going to start with a simplification. And that simplification is that these complex things people can be represented by very simple constructs. And the simple construct that I show here is that instead of a person, we're going to consider the person to be a well-stirred vat of liquid, water, for example. Now, how can, how can you get away with that? Well, one way to say we can get away with it is that we are mostly water, right? Our bodies are 90% water, and so, and so if you wanted to describe us sort of in the simplest possible way, we're water. That's largely what we are. We're structured water. We have water with a particular kind of shape and form, but we're largely water. And so we could describe where drugs go in the body by just thinking about how they dissolve in water. And all you need to know is what's the volume of the water. So if I give a dose, what concentration do you get? I give 10 milligrams. If your volume is five liters, what's the concentration you achieve inside? 
what did I say, 10 milligrams? I forgot what number I said now. 10 milligrams divided by five liters, two milligrams per liter. That's the concentration. And uh, that, that, that's the simplest way to define it. Now, how can I get away with saying that we're well stirred? And I indicate that in this, in this simple drawing by having a, this is a propeller that's stirring the vat of liquid. How can I get away with saying we're well stirred? Well, in some senses, we are. That's what our circulatory system does. And I'm going to talk about that in, um, in the weeks to come. But our heart is a very effective, uh, our heart and our blood vessels are a very effective system for distributing molecules very rapidly throughout a, l a large volume. And so we are, st uh, uh, we are stirred, we are well stirred in uh, certain senses. Now you could object to this simple model for lots of different reasons, but we're going to start with it because it's a very simple place uh, to start. And we're going to say then that we when we administer a drug, we're introducing a drug into this well-stirred um, vat of water that has a particular volume, and we're going to administer some dose, and we're going to produce some concentration. And now, what happens afterwards? Does that concentration stay the same forever? No, it, it, it doesn't, because we our body has mechanisms for getting rid of drugs. And we're going to describe that in our simple model by having an arrow pointing out that tells you how, um, how that tells you that drugs are eliminated when they're within your body. And we're going to make this a very simple process also and say that drugs are eliminated in proportion to their concentration in proportion to their concentration. So the more drug you have, the faster it gets eliminated. And as you have less and less drug, it gets eliminated more slowly. Now, this, uh, this, uh, the simplest way to describe this is to say that the rate of disappearance of a drug is equal to some constant times the concentration. The rate of disappearance of a drug is equal to some constant times the concentration. And uh, this constant is called a, a rate constant. And this is the concentration that would be within uh, the body. Right? This is a first order equation. Right? Means that the rate at which the drug is eliminated is proportional to concentration to the first power, or linear with concentration. As drug concentration goes down, since K is a constant for any particular drug, it's, it's one number. As the concentration drops from 2 milligrams per liter to 1 milligram per liter, the rate that your body eliminates it goes down by half as well. I like to think about this as, as um, uh, you could think about concentration as money in your wallet. right? And the rate at which I spend money, anyway, is proportional to the amount that I have in my wallet. As I, when I have more, I spend more. When I have less, I spend less. And the last dollar goes very really slowly. Right? The same thing here. When you have a lot of concentration, it get, your body gets rid of it fast. And, but the last molecules go out very slowly. Okay. If uh, we take this uh, simple uh, model and then apply it, and we introduce a dose directly into the body, now this well-stirred vat, and we say that it has some volume, and we say that drug is eliminated with some rate constant k, we could derive a simple equation, and this is derived in the book, in the, in the box at the back of the chapter, that would tell us how concentration varies with time. And that equation is shown here. The concentration is equal to the dose that I introduced, which is m sub 0, time, divided by the volume of the body times e to the minus kt, where k is this rate constant for disappearance of the drug. Now, if you don't understand when you look at the book where this equation comes from, um, it, that's not important. Some of you will and some of you won't. Uh, but you could trust me that, uh, that this is the equation that results from those simple assumptions that I talked about. So c is the concentration that's available in your bloodstream or in this vat of fluid that's available for action. And M0 is the amount that's introduced. And remember, I introduced it in a special way. I, I injected it right into the body. I injected it all into the body, the whole dose, at time t equals 0. 
I introduced it all into the body at once, so it was all available to circulate. That assumes the bioavailability is 100% and that I've introduced it all at one particular time. Right? So what is this really a representation of? It's a representation of intravenous injection, where I have a syringe and I inject all of the drug at once. And in that case, what this equation tells you is that the concentration immediately after you inject the drug is the highest. And after that, it continually goes down. And it goes down in an exponential fashion with a, with a, uh, with a time course that depends on this constant K. Now, does that make sense? If I have intravenous administration of a drug that's eliminated by a first order process, as soon as I administer it, the concentration is a peak, and after that, it goes down, and the rate at which it goes down depends on uh, this rate constant K. And I, what I also show you here is that if I, if I plugged into this equation, I asked the question, when does the concentration go down by a factor of two? When does it go down by 50 percent? I would look on this graph here and say 50 percent of the drug is gone by this time. I could calculate that time at which the drug concentration goes down by half, and that's equal to the natural log of 2 over k, this rate constant here. So when this number is smaller, the half-life is longer, right? So molecules with a high k are eliminated rapidly. Molecules with a low k are eliminated slowly. And, uh, and that half-life is a good measure of how long the drug activity lasts in your body. It's a good way of thinking about how long I'd have to wait before I needed another dose, for example. Uh, what this graph shows you here is just plotted on a semi-log plot, the difference between these curves if I had drugs with different half-life. A drug with a half-life of 600 minutes lasts a long time, right? Concentration doesn't drop until uh, a long time, uh, many, many hours. If it has a half-life of 60 minutes, concentration drops to 10 percent of its initial level after a few hours. And if I have a drug with a half-life of six minutes, concentration drops to 10 percent of its initial level after only, um, only a few minutes. And so uh, we're going to take this model and extend it next time and talk about more complicated modes of administration and talk about sort of new forms of drug delivery, uh, forms that you can expect to see in the next, uh, in the next few years.